state of affairs of RIA. We only have about 35 or 40 minutes. So my hope is that the panel will be able to give you a uh, solid baseline, perhaps even a table of contents, if you will, for the balance of the day's conversations, which I'm confident will drill down much more deeply into some pertinent issues. Uh, beyond that, it would be um, nearly impossible for us to cover the waterfront in great depth so we're gonna do our best and I'm very grateful to the panelists that we have assembled here today. Um, I'm in good hands because these guys know more than I will ever forget. Uh, so before we get started, I'm gonna ask each one of them to perhaps give a short introduction of yourself, uh, who you're with. Um, my guess is each of you probably need no introduction, but nevertheless, uh, Ali, why don't we start with you and go down the road. Good morning. Um, thank you for hosting this event. This is great. Um, Ronnie, uh, Reed, thank you guys. Um, Ali Jongiri, I uh, work with ev5investors.com and we have a portal and I work with a lot of people here. It's amazing to see the familiar faces. I turned over to Roberto. Hi, uh, Roberto Contreras. I'm Managing Director of Houston EB5. We're a vertically integrated uh, developer regional center in Texas. Um, we've been in business since 2011 as a regional center, worked with over 400 investors since then. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. Hi guys, I'm Ron Plasco. Uh, I'm the managing partner of Plasco Immigration Law Partners. Uh, we are uh, have a big EP5 practice. We, we have four parts to our EP5 practice. We represent developers and regional centers, represent investors. We have a compliance arm and we have a litigation arm. Um, I've uh, chaired uh, five terms, the AVA EB5 committee and the IUSA best practices committee, and I was a uh, co-counsel on the litigation we're going to talk about. Hi, my name is Rohit Puria, partner at Saul Ewing, Arnstein and Lair. Um, I have the great pleasure of sit sitting right next to Mr. Ron Plasco. So this is a man I've worked with for many years, and it, it indeed is a, is a pleasure, Rouse, to be here. Um, one element of housekeeping, I don't know if it's been mentioned, this session, this entire session for today is being live streamed. So just keep that in mind, panelists as well. Uh, there may be investors and possibly USCIS adjudicators watching. If I had known that, I would have done a longer introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. My name is Aaron Brown. I'm the executive director of IIUSA. Uh, just a very brief statement to really set the stage with regards to where we are now. Uh, 2022 was a watershed year for this industry. I don't need to tell you why. Uh, the reauthorization and then shortly thereafter, a very impactful lawsuit that we will get into uh, discussions about as well, not only uh, a little bit here, but I'm sure later on in the day um, to, to augment the conversation. As a quick matter of housekeeping for myself, um, I've, I've moderated, I don't know, four or five uh, panels at this point in my career. I think Ron Clasco has participated in roughly uh, 500 to 1,000 panels <laughs> so far in his career. Um, my preference is to have this panel be conversational. So I'm not going to ask the same question of each panelist. I'll ask a question, and then I'm going to ask the panelists even to react to each other's um, responses. And I'm also going to pause from time to time and ask if there are questions in the audience. I think that an iterative conversation with regards to a panel like this, and maybe all of them, will be much more beneficial than me asking you to hold your questions until the end. I'd much rather hear them, and I think the panelists would respond better if they were in the moment and in the context of what we're talking about. So. Um, when I do, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. I'd be more than happy to call on you and the panelists will, will respond. So I mentioned that um, there was a, a reauthorization check. And then I mentioned that there was a huge lawsuit, uh, not so much of a check. Um, the ramifications of that are still playing out and it very much 
colors the state of the industry uh, post the passage of RIA. So my first question is really going to be to Mr. Plasto, and I'll ask the other panelists to weigh in as well with their opinions and thoughts. But Ron, can you give us the state of play, how we got here, the basics of the litigation, and how you see things playing out from today forward? In five minutes or less. You have three and a half. Go. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think it, it's worth at least a little bit of time, not too much, going into you know, how we got to this litigation, what the issues were. Probably we're more interested in, in where we go from here. Um, but you know, as I was telling Aaron, it started with this piece of paper that I wrote on an airplane down to the IUSA conference that the day after USCIS published on its website that all regional centers are deauthorized. I said, that's not right. And I sat and wrote notes as to why it's not right on the airplane. And to the credit of IUSA, they asked me to present this. Uh, and the IUSA voted to authorize litigation. And with the help of IUSA and five other regional center plaintiffs, we litigated. Um, the, the main issue, we, we had a combination of, of policy issues, congressional intent, and language of the RIA. It starts with the fact that the title of, of the section of the, of the RIA is the reauthorization and reform of the EB-5 program. And to say that a bill to reauthorize and reform the EB-5 program was meant to put the program out of business, because when, when, when immigration had about 20-some I-924s to adjudicate, it took them two years. If they had 600 to adjudicate at the same time, you do the math. And we presented that to the judge. This would put the program out of business for an, uh, an unknown number of years. Um, we also talked, talked about the fact that the, so much of the language of the RIA is prospective. Uh, it, it talks about uh, the fact that under the new law, a, an exemplar petition under the prior law will have deference. Well, what is an exemplar petition? It's a regional center amendment, right? Filed by the regional center. How can you give deference to a regional center amendment if the regional center is out of business? That made no sense. Um, we talked about the fact that the that grandfathered investors in the statute are protected. Well, how can a how can a grandfathered investor be approved if under a law that requires regional center sponsorship if there is no regional center? Uh, so I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but these are some of the arguments that we made to the court. The end result was the the judge, Judge Chabria, issued a nationwide preliminary injunction preventing the immigration service from deauthorizing the regional centers. That's really unusual. And he did it because he said it was almost certain, I think that was his language, almost certain that the immigration service position is wrong. So a preliminary injunction is before you have a full hearing. Uh, and, and he said that the chances that this will ever be reversed are almost zero. So therefore he made it nationwide. That resulted in the government wanting to come up with some arrangement where we could agree going forward. The other option they had was to appeal that and who knows where we'd be. We had about a two month or a month and a half period where we were intense, uh, intense settlement negotiations with the government that resulted in the settlement agreement that I'm sure you've all read. Um, and we can talk about as much of that as you want, uh, but the settlement agreement put us back in the business. So the court signed the settlement agreement on September 1, and now as of September 1, we have guidelines. We don't have regulations, we don't even have final forms, but we, we have a program. And another thing that's almost unprecedented is the government agreed, this is something I suggested and kind of just threw out there, the government agreed that we will have quarterly meetings for at least two years to talk about this thing going forward and all the issues that are coming up. We had our first quarterly meeting. Um, there are several issues that we raised that were in the process of briefing to the government. Some of these are, are extremely time sensitive um, and, and, and involving what needs to be done by September 29th. So Aaron, I can talk about any of those, but you know, I wanna give everybody a chance to chime and give you a, a background of where we are. Absolutely. Any of the, do any of the other panelists wanna weigh in on the nature of the, of the settlement agreement or the conversation going forward? Well, my blood pressure just went up after an hour on. Um, my heart rate did too. Um, we're back in business, you guys. 
But bottom line, for the people that don't know, EB5 is back in business. It's again, it's alive again, which is great. And I see um, in LinkedIn, everyone says, I'm hiring. And I keep seeing that. And I guess they had let go of some people. And now that everyone's rehiring and the industry is going well. So thank you for all those who helped, uh, which is Ronnie and uh, Aaron and a bunch of other folks that aren't here today helped with the case. So who, who aren't here? I just want to thank those people that also helped that aren't here. Any questions? Yeah, Ronnie, you that's a pretty big topic to start with. And I thought that if there were any questions about the nature of the settlement, we could field them now or we can move on. Yeah, good question. Obviously, you move on than anybody else. How do you deal with are we protected in USCIS or something to do some stupid regulation without going through the quarterly meeting process? And what, what guarantee do we have they, they don't step in it? They like, for instance, they propose a 956K. It's a proposal. It doesn't work. It's got a lot of problems to it. But we can get the whole other panel will address that. How do we, what protections do we have as an industry? And what can you guys do on the negotiations in there and part of it, I know, try to prevent this from happening so they don't stumble yeah. again? Right. So, Ronnie, good answer on guarantee. And not really. Um, uh, where, where are we, oh, guys? We're, you know, we, we really now have a very viable program. Are there warts in the RIA? Sure, there are. But is this something that we can use going forward and, 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 and the EB-5 industry be revitalized? Absolutely. Um, the one drag is we have an agency, the Immigration Service, that really doesn't like this program. I mean, in all, in all honesty, they would prefer this program go away. And that's not great. And this is, has nothing to do with their area of expertise. So. The fact that we have quarterly meetings is, is really, really good because the chances of them just throwing something out with, with no notice is a lot less. And not only do we have quarterly meetings, Ronnie, but it's supervised by the court. So at any point where we feel they're in contempt, we can go back into court with the same judge. And they know that. So no, no, no guarantees, but I think we're in a much better position than we, than we would otherwise be. But the agency is, is the agency. Um, and we're, we're trying to establish, you know, we're, we're trying to make these meetings not adversarial. It's not us against them. In order for this to work, it's us. You know, we're, we're part of the solution, not part of the problem. We want to, and, and we, we set the groundwork for this in the first meeting, where we're trying to make it clear this is a really complicated law um, with a lot of issues. And we want to use this opportunity to give you the industry's feedback to make your job easier. That's going to take some trust over time. Hopefully that will reduce the chances of us being sabotaged with some absurd regulation. That's a long answer where I could have said, no, there's no guarantee. So apart from that, guarantee is not a clean word with an EB-5. So as most of us have learned over time. <laughs> no guarantee for that. Yeah. Um, I mean, the other the other element that's important to take into account with the RIA is we have effectively two periods. We have pre-RIA and we have post-RIA. And with the pre-RIA and most of the issuers here and attorneys in the room, you've got a set of investors that are basically stuck in limbo. We have approximately 13,000 I-526 petitions that have been pending and continue to pend with no end in sight. So personally, attorneys are always getting emails, hey, I filed in January of 2019. When is USCIS actually gonna adjudicate my petition? As counsel, I'm really tired of saying we had COVID um, and you know there was a retraction and there was this and there was change in law. That, that's just getting to be a frustrating response. We also have the ambiguity about what happens post RIA and that becomes a question of, well, how fast are these petitions going to be adjudicated going forward? With all the set-asides and all the improvements that we have, all the language and protections that we supposedly have in the ARA, that is a contentious issue for issuers, that is a contentious issue for regional centers, and particularly for prospective investors. So it is something that we will have to take into account. When we are preparing offerings, certainly issuers need to be very careful on this. They need to 
to make appropriate repertoires. And again, no guarantees, no promises, and the like, because this is in a state of flux uh, of the time piece. Okay, I'd like to just offer a little bit of optimism. Um, because, <laughs> Ronnie, you, you, you did say that the USAS does not particularly like this program. I think there's a lot of new people here at the USAS now, right? Uh, that it's more so they inherited a problematic program. And anytime you get a new job and you have, and you inherit an issue, yes, it's going to cause some headaches. And I'm sure it's causing a lot of headaches for them. And so nobody likes to have a headache. That being said, you know, we now have two channels of communication with the USCIS. You mentioned the quarterly meetings um, as a product of the lawsuit. And then also there's there's been some periodic listening sessions lately. And in the latest one, I think that the USCIS showed some good faith. Uh, they're really new to this, uh, and EB-5 is very complicated, so this is a complicated task for them, but they're showing that they're willing to engage with the industry to be educated by the industry as to what the best ways to move forward are as they start to create regulations around this new policy. Um, but I think the future is very bright compared to the last three years. You know, we got over the congressional hurdle, which was the big one, but uh, compared to the communication, the lines of communication that we've had with the USAIS, especially during the Trump administration, uh, things are much better now. Uh, back to kind of the way that they were before when things were working a little bit better. I'm going to shift gears on you guys a little bit. With the understanding that there is no black and white, there's always gray, especially in conversations like this. I've done my best to divide the questions I've drafted into questions about immigration under the new RIA and questions about investment and development under the new RIA. My first question, Roberto, will be to you with regards to immigration. I mean, perhaps this is a bit of a softball, um, and maybe some of you know the answer yourself. But the question is this, and it'd be interesting to hear your, your response. What stands out most among the RIA uh, Integrity Act provisions? How have these new Integrity Act, the, these integrity provisions, how have they reshaped the landscape with regards to immigration in particular, how a, how a potential investor looks at the program. I think the name speaks for itself, right? The Reform and Integrity Act. Um, so many times before, uh, investors could not really wrap their heads around why the program was riddled with so many issues. Uh, so many investors, you know, they're assuming that they're investing in a government program, right? They're, so they're assuming that the government is looking after them. Um, and it simply wasn't. And now I think with third party fund administration, uh, that's an all you to dig you see right there, right? But uh, third party fund administration, uh, you know, just best practice of having, you know, having to hold the, the funds in individual EB5 account, um, the, the amount of yearly reporting you need to be doing, all of the transparency measures. We have a much better program, a program that we can be a little more proud of, uh, and a program that hopefully in five years from now is not going to be so hard to get renewed because um, of the reforms that just you know recently came through. Ali, any thoughts on the on the integrity provisions? Um, well, I think I, I agree with about the optimism. Um, you know, a lot of the folks here have their 10,000 hours in the industry, and it's just good to be relevant again. Um, we were pretty irrelevant for about a year and a half, I would say. Um, so it's good to be back. You're not, on, I, I agree with you certainly, but not only for a year and a half, we're in a so much better position than we've been in for like five or six years. Because when we had three month extensions and six month extensions, there was, it was hard to have a lot of faith in the program. Yeah. Now we have at least until 2027, and every investor knows that they're grandfathered, which is a big deal. If they invest before 2027, um, so we have a much better program today than we've had for at least five or six years. I, I think my favorite part, which is kind of random, but it's that the industry size grew because as we were collecting a half a million dollar investors before. Now we're at eight hundred thousand dollars, so that means more money gets to go into the U.S. economy. And more jobs are created, and the more ho hotels and multifamily and apartments get funded with this cap great incentives. Just as a matter of timing, you know, EB5, let's not forget, it became very popular after the 08 crisis, right? Where banks tightened up and sources of financing dried up, and, and so people started to look through alternative forms of financing. 
we're in a rising interest rate environment. Uh, it's very possible that we could have a slowdown, that banks are actively tightening up. Uh, so it's actually a great time for EB-5 right now um, to go out and find quality projects, uh, especially projects that are maybe just getting up off the ground so that when they're done with construction, hopefully we're in a rebound and, and uh, you know, we get to ride that wave up. Any other comments? Well, I think the, the other element is with the RIA, we're going to get more quality deals, right? So the idea is this particular law is going to funnel out those you know, bad actors. It's going to provide a lot more confidence to investors. There is a lot more reporting. We will be talking about compliance and all the like later on this afternoon. But it, it's something that people should be aware of. Uh, gone are the days where somebody could slap together a business plan and you know recycle the old PPM and just go to market. Um, because now USCIS really wants to know what's going on. They want to know who the players are and they want to run background checks. So that's an extremely positive element from a legal standpoint when we look at it, uh, from the issuer standpoint, and also from an investor perspective, it is a better program. So yes, right, cause for optimism. Yes, more legal complexity. Um, and yes, still a level of ambiguity, but EB-5 is working. Hashtag. <laughs> Questions? Well, let's shift gears again then and go to the investment side of things and the development side of things. Uh, Senator Grassley was uh, adamant uh, and perhaps justifiably so that the new RIA, the new, the new law has rural set-asides. There are also set-asides for uh, infrastructure. Is there an opinion? Does the panel, does anybody on the panel have an opinion about these new rural set-asides, how they're going to impact uh, the identification and development of new projects, as well as what, what investors may think of the idea of investing in a, in a rural project? I'm going to jump in just for yeah. one second and, and say, you know, just because the project is rural, rural versus TEA, I think the smarter investors will go towards the better investments. It's my final question. I want to hear what you guys have to say. Part of the current and new landscape post RIA, at least from my perspective, has to be now what? What are we going to do next? The landscape is, is, a, is a foundation. It is an opportunity. And it gives us an obligation to think about what are the proximate and long-term priorities for this program. Help me do my job, guys. What's next? Well, I think there's one goal. Um, there's not many. Um, I think there's one goal is to increase the volume of the available uh, EB fund and to raise that from 3,000 to, I think that's what we need to do. I think that's where the lobbying effort should go is to, you know, we have a program that's defining itself and it's coming to its own existence through iterations of legislation becoming a better financial instrument. It's going to be coming, it's, it's getting the people that shouldn't be in this business out of this business. It's creating better results for the investors. Now all we need to do is increase the volume. We need to be able to place 20 billion of this product into the market annually, rather than giving out in supplement of giving out lottery and other visas. We should be adding this as a 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. What do I do? What's next? Uh, I, I, I think it's going to be, start, it's going to have to start with faster processing times, to your point. Um, $800,000 is a pretty significant investment. Um, we're in competition with other visa programs as well. And sadly, many of those other visa programs, the reason why investors go with them is simply because they're faster. Now the adjustment of status helps a lot. Um, there's still a lot of education and awareness that needs to, that needs to come out around that. But um, you know, if we have an efficient program that really is 120 days, right? Which isn't impossible. We, we did have four month approvals 10 years ago. Um, then I think we're going to see way more investment. And then from there, we can go and fight for more visas. Ron? 
So, and from my point of view, there are so many legal issues that are open issues that, you know, my going forward now is trying to work with the immigration service in getting favorable resolution of a lot of these open issues, kind of as a preview for the panel we're going to do this afternoon. Some of these are, are really urgent issues. Uh, if a regional center is not going to do any new projects and doesn't file an I-956 by December 29, will it be terminated? And if so, what's the ramifications of that? Um, and will they have to file an annual statement? And is it on the I-956G form? Does the RIA apply to pre-existing projects? Are there fund administrator and audit requirements for prior projects? Does the RIA apply to redeployments? Uh, I won't go through the whole list of issues because a lot of this we'll talk about in the afternoon panel. Uh, and the other thing is that we've been, uh, uh, we commented on every single one of the forms, the I-956 forms, um, uh, et cetera. And new forms under the settlement agreement, they're in what's called interim forms. Uh, the new forms have to be published by December 1st. We hope that the new forms and instructions will be better than the interim forms, and then we have to see what they look like. So I guess from my point of view, Aaron, it's trying to, now that we have this law and we have an ongoing forum with the Immigration Service, uh, fill in the holes in, in the RIA and hopefully in a favorable way. Right, you have the last word. So I'll, I'll kind of tag along that. We keep in mind exactly how much money this program is bringing into the into USCIS. So with that, faster processing and more reform and better adjudications and adjudicators staffing up is, is the key here. Each regional center is paying $17,795 every for, for the 956. They're paying the $17,795 for the 956F. They're paying $3,035 for the 956G. They're, I mean, the amount of money that's coming into the IPO right now is in, intense. So with that, they actually have the ability, they have the capacity, and they have the dollars to actually staff up. And that is something that they need to do right now. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.